Just a word of prayer before I start. Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for your word. Thank you that from it we can draw truth and that uh, that truth is practical. It's helpful. We learn from it that you love us and then we learn how that love uh, in practical terms um, affects us. And Lord, as we listen to your voice this morning, I pray that you would teach us uh, about your love and how it affects us. Lord, be with my words. Bring power to it and clarity that might not be there uh, under my own strength and wisdom. I pray that in the name of Christ. Amen. So two weeks ago, uh, I preached this sermon on guilt. And I said something that uh, might sound counterintuitive, that, that guilt is a gift, that guilt is like a spiritual and emotional nerve ending, um, that it, when we're doing something wrong and we don't feel guilty, and uh, that that is uh, th that we become a sociopath then. Uh, the memory of guilt is what keeps us from doing the same things over and over again, the same mistakes that cause us pain. And I use the example of stubbing your toe. That stubbing your toe is painful. And we don't want to stub our toes. So what we retain is the memory of the pain. And that is a little bit like guilt. We remember what it's like to feel guilty. We remember what it's like to feel that pain. And it warns us and directs us away from the things that we do that, that cause us pain. And still, we still do often the same thing over and over again. We do not learn very easily, even though the things that we do cause us pain. We're not in pain now. You don't have a, a, a pain in your toe, but it is the memory of the pain that keeps us from stubbing our toes again and being careful. If we're still experiencing the pain of guilt, then we need to let it go because the promise is that we are under Christ, we're washed clean, we're guiltless. We're, 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 we're guiltless. We need to experience the grace and forgiveness of God. So that was the previous sermon. And it was spectacular. Let's face it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this, this week I want to deal with this subject of fear. And the subject is a little bit the same. Pain keeps us from doing painful things and damaging ourselves, and, and fear is a little bit the same. Uh, it's similar in that there are things that are fearful. There are things that we should fear. There's no doubt about that. The problem is that we live in fear of things that we shouldn't live in fear about. There are things that we should be afraid of. And there are things that we have no right to be afraid of. But I know that being afraid ties me up, ties us up, that we face situations uh, that seem to overwhelm us. Fear keeps us from doing the things that we know we should do. We're frightened to uh, just witnessing 
Who here is just totally comfortable with witnessing? Dale's not here. Dale seems to be pretty comfortable <laughs> with witnessing, but it's a gift, right? And, we, and we, we're, we're, we're fearful, but we should be doing it. And when Paul uh, talks many times about, about fearing and being bold, he's, he, he understands the fear. And so when he talks about fear and being bold, he's always, not always, but mostly talking about the fear of witnessing and, 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 and standing up for Christ. So that's a common fear we have, and it's not valid. Um, and I could go down that road, I, 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 but I'm not going to. But fear can also force us to do things that we know we shouldn't do. I was going to try to come up with some examples, um, and there are too many to choose from in my own life, so I'm steering clear. But I have lived a life of fear. I suspect uh, a lot of us have those areas where we look back and we see that fear has locked us up. Fear has directed our path in ways that we should never have gone. Fear has kept me from doing many, many things. And that fear is also kept me uh, responding poorly to many situations. Um, so I want to apply this to a specific area of life. More as an example, but, um, but it's, it's one that we all, we all share. We're social animals and uh, this is the area of relationships. Um, we learn from an early age that every relationship we enter has the potential of being hurtful. You know, when you're a kid and you try to make friends and you get rebuffed, well, that hurts. Or, and, it, and then it goes from there, it goes from there, it goes from there, and we learn, we learn to fear people, we learn to fear fear, uh, uh, being honest with people. There's just so many things that bind us up. From the earliest age, we are learning these things. So what we do is we learn to protect ourselves out of fear. We build walls. Um, we learn to act disingenuously, which is a word. We learn to avoid relationships. We learn to control, to be in control of our relationships so that nobody can hurt us. We learn to hide ourselves in relationships. Even in the church, I've noticed, I mean, I've been in the church my whole life. And I've observed the way people put on this mantle of godliness and stuff when they're at church. They, they, they learn the language. They learn how to act holy. Because they're afraid of being judged. And we do that all the time. We do all this because of the fear we have in experiencing pain. And the other fear that we have is being without a relationship. We fear being lonely. We fear being rejected and not being accepted for who we are. It's kind of the opposite side of the same coin. And so we chase after relationships to counter those sorts of fears. And we make choices poor choices very often because of uh, those sorts of fears. And, and so we enter into relationships that are perpetually hurtful, very often. 
Now that's just one, I bring that up because I think we've got a commonality here. But we could take that, we could apply it to a whole bunch of different things, other aspects of life. So that's just one way of looking at fear and what it does to us. When we raise kids, we raise them to be confident. We don't, we don't want our kids to just live in fear of everything. We don't want them to live in fear of situations that they should be able to handle. And so part of parenting is allowing your kids to go out and skin their knee and, 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 and do things because we want them to, to not be afraid of the pain of taking chances and so on up to a point. And then we want them to be afraid of the things that we know will hurt them. And kids, myself included, learn those lessons the hard way. We want our kids to become fearless by facing situations and surviving them. And they learn what to fear and they also learn what to overcome. And they learn that they can overcome. That's, that's part of the goal is independence and, and, and the ability to, to handle stress and to handle life and to do it with a certain confidence. So scripture tells us that we should not live in fear. That that's not the kind of life that God wants us to have to be bound up with these fears. God is our parent. And I have noticed that God does not simply protect us from every pain and suffering that comes along. We are exposed sometimes to incredible pain and suffering. And we have to realize that that's part of God's will for us. That's part of how we learn. That's how we gain some semblance of understanding what we can overcome. We are to be overcomers. First, uh, 2 Timothy 1.7 For the Spirit of God gave us for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. That's a, a, an amazing verse. That we're not supposed to be timid. There's more than that. Joshua 1.9 Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now that's aimed at, at the nation of Israel who is uh, being attacked. He's, uh, God is addressing a certain situation that is fearful. And yet he's saying, I'm commanding you, be strong and courageous because I am with you. Isaiah 41 Verse 10 is similar. Do not, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. There's an image <clears throat> that, that I, I think is helpful. There there are people with clubs about to hit us. But there is safety in a mother bear protecting her cup. And that is the kind of comfort that we are supposed to have. Knowing that yes, there, there is potential pain out there. But God is there always. The, the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God is not 
caught by surprise when things happen in our life that, that discombobulate us. Yeah, that's another word. That's another word. Yeah. It is important that we learn to fear the right things, though. Uh, and Scripture tells us many times, many times, in many ways, all through, from the Old Testament to, to the New Testament, that we are to fear God. And Jesus tells us this in, this, in the starkest terms. Uh, Luke 12. Verses 4 and 5. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. That's pretty stark. That's pretty abrupt. But there's truth there. Now, Years ago, uh, I preached a sermon um, in this church about fearing God. And here's the image that I, that I dropped, uh, and maybe some of you will remember. But um, in, in Peace River, where I was born, there was a, a, a train trestle up above town. It went over uh, a, a a steep sort of uh, canyon. And we used to have uh, picnics in a picnic ground above where the, where the trestle was. And we were told not to ever go out on the trestle. And I don't know whether people made this up to scare us, but there, there had been Apparently, a couple of kids that were out on the trestle and the train came and they couldn't make it off and they, they, they were killed. Now, that's kind of a, probably not true, but at the time, right? That's, it put an indelible, uh, that's a word too, uh, uh, image in your head. Now, the safe thing to do if you wanted to get to the other side was to climb down the trail that went down to the creek and, and, and up. That's the safe thing to do because you don't have to worry about the train. But why do you go to the extra effort of walking down the trail and up the other side? You do it not because you live in fear of the train, but you do it because you fear the train. Do you, do you, you get it? That we're, It's like... When you're walking home or, or when you're walking along the street, uh, uh, do you fear the traffic? No, you're on the sidewalk. Why don't you walk in the middle of the street? Because you fear getting hit. You have a fear of cars, but you don't have the fear of cars when you're not in their way. So I think that is what it means to fear God. Not to live in fear of this this ogre who's going to punish you and, and, and so on. But the only reason we can live without that fear is by having a right relationship with God and understanding his grace. Now, that was 12 years ago or 13 years ago or whatever that I preached that. There's another image that I want to put out there regarding fear and it's another bridge and this is a pedestrian bridge and God tells us to walk on the pedestrian bridge because there's lions and tigers and bears down there and cliffs and there's snakes and and spiders that are this big and, and we should not walk down into that we should walk along this narrow pedestrian bridge because that's the safe thing to do. And when we're on that safe thing, we're safe we're, when we're on that. Because walking the way of God, walking the path that God wants us to, if we're doing that, is safe. 
So do you understand the, the, the one is the fear of God that keeps us from walking on the bridge. The other one is the fear of life and dangerous things by walking along the straight and narrow. Did I confuse everybody there? I think it's an important image to keep in your head when it comes to fear. There are things out there that are fearsome that we should be avoiding. And we've all watched people uh, go down into that valley and get beat up and stung, and the, 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 the spiders especially. Just, oh. But it, it's hurtful down there. And walking along that, that pedestrian bridge is where we should be. Because when we do that, we're free of fear. I hope that, I hope that, that, that image you can keep in your head. After we learn uh, to fear the right things, then we can live without being bound by fear. And this is the main point I'm trying to, to make here. The Bible uses this phrase, fear not, so many times. Uh, we're not supposed to be living in fear. Do you think about it. I mean, we're all different. We all have those areas that terrify us. We're not supposed to be living in fear. We're supposed to be free of fear. We're supposed to be making sure that fear does not bind us up and stop us from doing what we should be doing. If we don't trust God, it's because we don't understand the control he has over every situation. And I don't know, uh, we all go through things that are, that are somewhat fearful. Uh, you know, this isn't a great example because I don't fear it, but you know, I got laid off on Monday, and um, so now my situation changes, and I'm, you know, it's not ex unexpected, but there have been times when I have been laid off or the situation changes and, and, and there's that deep, that deep dread of what's going to happen next. What's the future going to be like? How am I going to cope with this future? And fear can become overwhelming and can make us live our life uh, so agitated and so bound up in fear that we just can't do anything. We are supposed to be fear, free from fear. In a world where God controls every molecule, every situation, God is in control. I remember a particularly bad um, time in my life when, when I was living out in New Brunswick. I had been working for a denomination um, somewhat for, and, and they had, some people had promised me a job. I'd been working out there for over a year and I never got paid during that year. Um, I was trying to renovate a house and th things went badly there and uh, just everything was collapsing. I was watching all my money just float away. And I had come out to see my dad not long before he passed away. And uh, he was driving me to the airport. And he knew what I was going through. <laughs> and there's this song. Uh, God will take care of you. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. It, it, it's an old song. But he was singing that to me on the way to the airport. And I, I have never forgotten that. that. That was his word to me to try to settle me and to have a perspective. And I think of that all the time, of him singing that song. Because it's true. 
it is true that it, no matter what happens, no matter if my life is taken, it's still true. But we have to remind ourselves of that. It's not, it's not an understanding. It's an understanding that get a, gets attacked by life. And I am absolutely sure when I sing that, when I sing that in my head or I remember my dad singing that to me, that it is the one truth that um, can change my life. And what I need is the discipline to continually remind myself that that is true because it's an effort, right? It's an effort when bad things happen or we're unsure, we're skittish. Then it's an effort to go, Okay, but what I know for certain is that God is in control, that I am a child of God. I am following after God, and I am his child, and I have a relationship with him, and therefore, it doesn't matter what happens to me, God is in control. I want to finish by using a, a, a stark contrast. We Christians believe that death is going to be overcome. We believe that when we die, that that is not the end. And that we will overcome death by the power of Jesus. When we get baptized, we... We are dead, we're buried, and we're resurrected. That's the symbol. And we hang on to that. That is our hope. Without it, nothing else matters. Death is going to be overcome. And we have this hope of resurrection. Therefore, the fear of death, Paul calls it the sting of death, should not bind us. If we can believe that, that death can be overcome, not by our own effort, not by anything that we could do, that death is going to be overcome, then we should be able to believe that a minor thing, like a disaster, like opposition, like bad health, like poverty, all these things are nothing to God. God can fix them in an instant. Death is uh, this massive thing that everybody is afraid of death. But we shouldn't be. But it is an enemy. It is a powerful enemy. And God, through Jesus, has overcome death. And if he can overcome death, then he can overcome whatever you're going through. Death is no small thing. And we trust God that he can take care of that big thing. And we, learn, we need to learn to trust him in the small things that only seem big to us. Amen? Dear Heavenly Father, you are so gracious to us. You are powerful. And our problem is that we just have, have such a hard time seeing you clearly, seeing your glory, seeing your power. We have such a difficult time with that. Lord, teach us to see you for who you are in your majesty so that when we sing your praises, we're overwhelmed by the power you have and by the love you have for us, Lord. That you are watching over us. You are on our side. And yes, you do let us deal with sometimes horrible things. You allow us to skin our knees and stub our toes. And yet you're right there. loving us and caring for us. Lord, help us to 
truly understand who you are in relationship to us. I pray this in the holy and powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.